meeting to order. This is the regular school board meeting of the Edina School Board, August 14th, 2017. We do have a quorum. Uh, John, can you just walk us through the highlights of tonight's meeting? Sure. There's been no board meeting since July 17th. Tonight, uh, you'll approve your uh, minutes from the July 17th meeting. Um, take time to listen from, uh, from audience members. And you have a consent agenda with uh, different personnel items and um, agreements. Um, also, for and then for reports and discussions, we'll hear from um, Early Education and Edina Community Education. Um, from the policy committee on a policy review and um, talk about student our in, internal staff family and student surveys as well as our uh, community uh, surveys that uh, line up with what you're going to talk about with regards to action tonight uh, around the operating levy renewal and increase you'll also uh, call a general election for that levy as well as the uh, election of school board members uh, approve the long-term facilities maintenance program budget and additional policy reviews so great Thank you very much. You're welcome. The first item is approving the minutes of the July 17th work session and the July 17th regular session. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Are there any changes to the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the minutes of July 17th work session and July 17th regular session, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next, we have hearing from members of the audience. Uh, Mr. Adderhold is our one speaker. I think you know the rules, so I'm not going to repeat them. Welcome. Grab a mic. Thank you. Um, maybe not. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, yay. Uh, well, I did want to address the levy discussion that will be had tonight and the action, but I first wanted to thank the board for um, the Fraser Mental Health um, annual contract that's on the consent agenda. It will expand mental health care for students in the district and I and I'm really excited about that so thank you for considering that um, I just wanted to come forward as someone um, in support I was the the email you received about uh, <laughs> the operating levy and to um, have it be um, one uh, just one increase rather than the two-part phase in I think it's incredibly important that we um, fully fund our public schools as soon as we can um, I've knocked on hundreds of doors this summer with neighbors and a uh, theme that I hear is, you know, how can we keep our schools excellent? And I think it's incredibly important we go to the cap. Uh, when, when we speak to neighbors that have concerns, it's, it's about fiscal transparency. So where are my dollars being spent? Folks are willing to, to raise their own taxes, but they want to make sure their dollars are, uh, they can see exactly where their dollars are being spent. So uh, I know there were some concerns about potentially higher tax aversion with going straight to that cap rather than waiting two years. But on the flip side, I think we have to consider folks will also maybe be startled when their taxes go up, not once but twice in a two-part phase and rather than that one. So um, I'm just someone that wanted to voice support for the just the one phase in. I know it's potentially a little bit trickier to pass, but I know with the 50 plus discussions we'll have in the community, we'll uh, rally behind whichever options push. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have the consent agenda. Are there any items that anyone would like to have removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next, we are on to reports and discussion. We are on to the Early Education and Community Education Services strategic update from Val Burke. So this is a um, uh, report on uh, the strategic program update for both um, early education and community education. So um, I always think one of the most exciting things uh, school boards do is listen to the programs that you govern. And um, of course, I'm new to all this, and this is really exciting. So it's uh, great to have Val and Leah here to talk about uh, early education and community ed. Okay. Good evening. I don't think we're quite You're on. You're Thank yeah. you. Couldn't hear myself. Uh, members of the board, Superintendent Schultz, colleagues and community members, um, Edina Public Schools Community Education Services leverages partnerships and collaborations to promote learning for all. In August of 2015, we came to you, the school board, with our three-year strategic plan, which was adopted in partnership with the Next Generation Learning Plan. Edina Community Education built our plan around four priorities 
which provide the underpinning of all of our work. Coherent and comprehensive programs, creation and sustaining of effective and valued partnerships, the development of intentionally designed flexible spaces for all of our learners, and the development and, of, and impl implementation of clear and effective communications to promote and better identify community education services programs and partnerships. Tonight, we're here and happy to update you on year three of our plan and lay out our implementation priorities for the 2017-18 school year. I'm pleased to be here tonight with Leah Bird, um, one of the co-coordinators of our Early Learning Center, which opens on September 6th. Lisa Hawthorne is our other co-coordinator, and unfortunately, she was unable to be here with us tonight. So Leah will update you on our Early Learning Center implementation plan, and then I will briefly come back and update you on our Kindergarten through Adult Plus plans, and after finishing, we'll be happy to entertain any questions that you may have. So Leah? Well, Superintendent Schultz and Board Chair Freeman and board members and community as a whole, I'm excited to be here, a little nervous, but I love a microphone. Um, so I'm here today to share a little bit about our Early Childhood Center, which is near and dear to my heart, and I know some of you, and so um, just here to give you a brief update, because I know our time is limited. So I want to start by sharing a little bit about our two-year-old programming, which um, we heard from our families and our feedback that that was a really important program, and they wanted to see that return. And so in the past, that's been called two-day twos, and so this coming school year, we'll be coming out with something called a taste of preschool follows a very similar model to two-day twos, except for it's just a little bit more ramped up. Kids come one day with their parent, and then the other day they come and they really get to learn about being at school independently, and what does that look like uh, in an appropriate setting for a two-year-old. And um, I'm really happy to say that that was a program that filled up right away as soon as we opened registration. And I looked at the numbers today, I believe it's 111 <coughs> two-year-olds, so I'm kind of excited to see them coming around school. And then the... The other day is just an independent learning day. The kids will come alone without their parent. We worked with DHS to get a, an exemption from the, um, the policies. It, the programming is offered in a little less. Um, we don't have as many days that we can offer it. Right. But we have real strict stipulations that Leah yeah. and her team have implemented. Yeah. So. Yeah. It was a huge It's great. Win. Yeah. That it's really great. When we when we broke it down and really looked at the when we looked at the stipulations, we broke it down and figured out that we can offer the program. We we need to start a little bit later than the rest of the year, and we need to end a little bit earlier. But really, the difference is only a week or two. So it's it's a big win. We're excited. Yeah. It's great. It's great. Thanks. I didn't really do it, but we all did it. <laughs> um, Strike that from the minutes. Okay, second thing I wanted to share a little bit is just about some of our coordination and partnerships with our cultural liaisons. I'm sure that you've already heard that we have an additional cultural liaison coming, a, a South Asian cultural liaison, and that's Priya Rao. So for those of you that have taken parenting classes, you know Priya. She will be um, half time as a cultural liaison and half time as a parent educator. And while she doesn't officially start work until September 6th, she has dove in headfirst and really just been um, such an asset to us this summer. And then um, with our Edina Resource Center as well, we're working to really help provide our families programming um, or opportunities that help them be successful. And if for some reason we can't provide that, our role is to really know where can we send them? Who can we connect our families with so that they can get whatever resource they need? So we're, we're really excited about that, and we have a, a couple of other partnerships in the works as well. So um, it's going to be really exciting. And then the third thing I wanted to share is that moving into the 17-18 school year, we're going to take a year to do a parent education program study. And that really is a year for us to reflect on, really listen to our community about our parent ed program. What do they like? What don't they like? Where do we need to offer programming that's a little bit uh, more family friendly or fits into the needs of our families? And maybe what are we doing that we don't necessarily need to continue on with anymore or maybe need to reduce a little bit of it? So it's really kind of exciting and, and I'm kind of looking forward to a year of focus groups and engaging with families to really hear what do you like about parent education and what do we need to continue to do and what do we need to grow more of? Oh yeah. 
Okay, and so then the, the next thing I wanted to share a little bit is our all-day pre-K is starting, and this is really exciting. We have an all-day pre-K program that will be going on downstairs, and it will have wraparound care just like out of school time. So kids can come to school anytime after 6.30 in the morning and be dropped off, and then their school day starts at 9 and goes till 3 in the afternoon, and then they can be picked up anytime in the afternoon up until um, 6 o'clock at night. And so this is gonna be taught by a licensed teacher. We'll be teaching it. She's wonderful, the teacher that we have doing it. And then we'll have two classroom aides as well, experienced aides that are used to working with kids. And really we know that we don't want kids to be at school for 12 hours a day. And so how are we providing opportunities for them to be kind of in and out of the classroom and have other opportunities? So. Um, I invite you all to come to the Early Learning Center when it's open, but we have a playground, we have a gym, we have a multi-purpose room, we have a smart room. We're really trying to provide opportunities for kids to be active in their learning as well. And uh, the, the next thing I wanted to touch on is staff development offerings for all staff in early learning. We're really working hard as we bring together our early childhood special education teams and our regular education teachers to really create one school. And part of becoming one larger team means that we all participate in the same training, whether it be equity training, whether it be curricular training or assessment training. And, and I would say through my first year, I'm, I am at 11 months, three weeks, and three days. And in my first year, the, the collaborative nature of the teachers in their training and PD group has just been amazing. And then lastly, just to continue, we're working on providing some high quality enrichment opportunities. Um, our all day is going to have Spanish infused into it, but we're also gonna try to provide some enrichment class, Spanish classes for our kids. And that's just a logistical thing that I'm still kind of working a little bit on, but uh, really fun and exciting things happening in early childhood. I'll kind of continue on with our implementation plans for our kindergartner through 12th grade learners. Um, they have all been built around a school-wide partnership model that supports each, each individual building goals. For K-5, that has meant that our coordinator, Meg Barrett, and her team have been working with building principals to create a 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. model of safety supports and program options for students in the building. Out of school time managers oversee our school age care program. That provides one of the most flexible programs in the metro area. A family can do one morning, one afternoon, or full time five days a week, um, all day long, or anything in between. We also, our, our staff also partners with building staff to assist with recess and ensure that students are surrounded by consistent messaging and consistent staff so that as they move from before school to during the school day to after school, they're seeing the same friendly faces and hearing the same building messages. Programming is offer, also offered on school release days, school vacations, and during the summer. This provides a family in Edina with seamless options for those who need consistent, reliable, high quality care. Community education also offers enrichment options that really can spark a kid's need to learn something different. It can be music, it can be robotics, it can be fencing, archery. We really take time to listen to our community and the programming changes depending on what the needs and values of the community are. In partnership with teachers, our out of school time managers oversee our summer and school year targeted services options. And that provides additional learning opportunities for students who need more time beyond the day. This OST building model provides a comprehensive, easy to navigate set of options for families. Moving to our middle school youth, we're really excited to debut a program delivery system that is based on their developmental needs. We've spent almost three years researching best practices around the area and nationally and talking to staff, students, and parents in focus groups. And we're excited to offer a set of options that includes clubs, enrichment, and really their voice, which said we want informal and intramural, rec intramural recreation options. The goal for our buildings at each middle school is to create a sense of belonging for students in those impressionable middle school years. For our 9th through 12th graders, we're working with building administration there to continue to offer the opportunity for students to earn a community service letter and to better align our, in our curriculum based service learning options to our youth serving youth after school clubs. Again, the goal is to create a seamless system for youth to be able to share their voice to affect community issues that matter to them 
whether it be in school or out of school. For our adults, we've built on our Learn, Serve, and Connect model. Coordinator Cheryl Gunnis is overseeing our volunteer team, our adult learning team, and our service teams. Goals this year are to showcase a refreshed adult learning space here in the community center so that our adults can better learn with us. We're also continuing to build on our year-round volunteer opportunity model, which invites businesses, community members, and, student, and students to serve with us. This summer alone, we had over 40 youth volunteers helping with our out-of-school time models at Highlands and Creek Valley, and that just continues to, to, to grow. And finally, in partnership with our advisory council, we're sponsoring some evenings that will invite community organizations and members to share their voice with us and also through focus groups and special events so we can invite community to better connect with us. This is truly an exciting year of implementation after three years of planning for Edina's Public Schools and for Edina Community Education, and we really thank you for the opportunity here tonight to share with you. Thank you, any questions? Yes, there it is. First, thank you. Edina is so fortunate to have the robust community education program that exists. So it thanks to both of you and the strong team that has built this and continued to refine it. My question is about middle school. And this, my understanding is that this replaces the surge program. Is that accurate? Correct. We retired surge, which was for sixth through ninth graders um, in the spring. We did run a full service model in the summer, which we will continue to do for our middle schoolers and on school release days. But the new middle school program will be four days a week and really in more of the club and recreation intramural model. So is there another kind of option or a, a fit for a student and a family who may not necessarily feel a connection with the clubs, but there's still a need for some kind of out of school time support? There's academic options. There will mm -hmm. also be options through the play. We're in conversation and in partnership with the building principals to kind of, like, there will still be knowledgeable. There will be a, a really wide myriad of options. And what we're working on is how do we make it easy for families to navigate. So we're sharing duties with registration options right now, and our goal really ultimately is to get to one registration model. So we can kind of mirror this option of who's in our building and create that safety net for students and families. Okay, thanks. Um, I had a question around the um, all day pre-K. Um, are we doing anything to target any particular um, children that may need more of these type of services to help better prepare them for kindergarten? Or is it purely just open to anybody to enroll? Well, it's an interesting um, thing. We do we do try to target kids, and we are, we actually will have an intervention interventionist teacher who will serve our four year olds. And so her role is to really go off of our baseline data in the fall to say who are our kids that might need a tier one intervention or a two a tier two intervention, and then she will be working with them one on one and doing some uh, inclusion in the classroom and then also some pull out and then small groups as well. One of the interesting pieces about early childhood um, scholarships is that if you're familiar with pathway one or pathway two scholarships, you have to, the, the classroom has to have a parent aware rating to be, mm -hmm. to, to receive yeah. the dollars. And because we're under construction and we're using new classroom space, it can't be rated yet. And so as soon as, our all day space. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we, and I've already talked to the Department of Ed and everything about it, so as soon as we get in there, our role, our goal is to really get our parent aware rating right away so that we can tell families, we have the rating, please use your scholarship dollars. Okay, but are just within some, don't we offer scholarships through the PTO as well? So our PTO has typically offered scholarships. This past year, they did not offer as many scholarships because okay. I, I said I have dollars through Pathway 1, Pathway 2, SR factors. And so it will be something that we'll need to come back. Path, uh, pathway 1 and 2 dollars in 2020 will be decreased or limited. So we will need to come back to our PTO, but just for this particular cycle, we, we weren't okay. using those dollars. Thank you. And then my other question was around, um, you said you were going to do some research around parent education. Tell me a little bit more about what you're trying to look for there. 
Well, really, um, we offer a really nice model, very traditional in the way that we, we have it. Families can come and take classes with, um, their child can take a class and then they can take the parenting ed part maybe an hour afterwards. And sometimes it's once a week or once a um, month or however. But one of the things that we want to look at is that model doesn't work for every family. And so uh, one of the things that we're going to pilot in our parent um, our parent education program center is an online class because for some families they might want to try parent education through an online means. We also have uh, one of our teachers who's going to do um, specific groups focused on age groups. She's doing a girls group. But really we're open to a lot of different discussions and, and my role for the beginning part of it is to listen to our parents about why do you take a parent ed class? What drives you to come here? And then really to ask the people that aren't here why aren't you coming to take a class? Why doesn't it work? Because I really truly believe everybody wants to learn how to be a better parent. People love tips and tricks and they love the camaraderie that happens in parent ed, but that model doesn't fit for every family today. And so really our goal is to try to find um, new and different models that families might like, but still work within the capacity of what parent education is. Okay. And are you looking at beyond ECFE as well? Yes. The, the older parenting? Yep. Yeah, definitely, beyond ECFE, anything that has a parenting component in any capacity will kind of roll into this program study. Excellent, thank you for all your work. Thank you. Any other questions? I think you're done. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Next item is policy review, Regina. All right, so first just want to thank again as we do every month recognizing Stacy Geyer and Sarah Shandle for all of their support as we review policy and just a reminder that all policies are posted on the district website so they're they are accessible to anyone who would like to view them and then any policies discussed in our agenda or up for action are available in the board packet that's posted online so this evening we're we have four policies up for discussion for each of these, the additions and changes that have been made are mostly just general updates and compliance with statute. Policy 521, student disability notification, includes an updated student disability discrimination grievance report form in Appendix 1. Uh, 526, student hazing prohibition, there's clarity and compliance updates throughout that policy, specifically in sections 2 and 3 with the general statement of policy and several of the definitions. Appendix 1 in this policy is updated to conform with the appendix that's in policy 413, harassment and violence. These policies are intended to align, so the report form for both is updated in order to match. 529, the staff notification of violent behavior of students, um, updates throughout for clarity and compliance. And then finally, 634, Electronic Technologies Acceptable Use Policy. This one's reviewed annually. I um, want to thank Steve Butner specifically for his guidance in keeping us current with this policy and updating all of our references. Um, I'll just pause there, see if there are any questions that anyone would like to raise so that we can take them back to the policy committee. Any questions? <clears throat> so on 634, you got input from Steve? Correct. And did we get input from teachers about what might be working or not working in the classroom? Steve, is that something you could speak to for more specifics? I think I heard the question, good evening board. I think I heard the question as, did we get guidance from teachers? Correct. Yes, we did. Mike, M Michael Walker and Megan uh, Herbert, who are our digital learning specialists, weighed in on this policy, reviewed it for us, and they've got a, they're both teachers and educators, and they've got a pretty good eye on how our teachers are using the technology in the classroom and making sure that we're safe, yet providing our teachers and students access to digital tools to impact instruction. Thank you. Um, under the general statement of policy, I would just take a look again at the first sentence to see if that's really necessary. This is in 634? 634. 634. I haven't left that policy. Yep, thank you. It just didn't sound like a statement of policy. The Not first it. sentence in the general statement of policy. Correct. Okay, we'll review that. I don't want to monopolize, so anybody else have anything else they want to ask? Great. 
Okay. Thank you, Regina. You're welcome. Next, we have stakeholder surveys, uh, the Susans. Distinguished Susan Brock from Communications and Susan Tennis from Teaching and Learning. Um, so um, I'm going to ask uh, to advance to the next slide. I think James is going to do that. So, um, so as I'm learning about um, Edina, um, the school districts do surveys all the time, and they are they really hold a place. Some are um, internal, which you'll hear tonight. Uh, your stakeholder surveys of your parents, your students, your staff are. School district and internal surveys uh, with those stakeholders. I do want to just bring to the board's attention that you know those are not as scientific as compared to the, the, the community surveys you do with Morris Leatherman. That gives you a re, uh, really gives you a measure of external and internal validity. So, um, and so, so one of the things uh, as we were talking about uh, this presentation. One of the things I would like to do with the lead team is to look at the purpose of surveys and how they're used um, uh, within the district. Uh, they do have a place, just uh, figuring out where that place is at and ensuring that the purpose of the surveys um, um, really uh, meet the purpose that they're, they're trying to serve. Also, there's some uh, additional statute around student surveys that we need to be attentive to. So. Um, so throughout the year, I'm going to be taking some time to uh, have conversations around surveys and come, come back uh, to you with a report of some sort that would give you an idea of how the surveys will be used in the district. Does that make sense? So I'll turn it over to um, Susan's. Yes, Susan Squared, that's what we like to call ourselves. We do. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Schultz and members of the board. So um, as Dr. Schultz mentioned, we did want to clearly identify the differences between these surveys. They are all useful information. And we also wanted to start out by saying that surveys are just one way that we look to gather input from our stakeholders. And so we use a variety of, whether it's a focus group or a task force, or we have some other online opportunities, just general conversations. We want to make sure that we have a variety of input and that survey isn't the only opportunity that our stakeholders have to give us. And so as Dr. Schultz already articulated, there are differences between the, the kinds of surveys that we administer, and they come with cost and investment, obviously. But I'm going to let uh, Susan Tennyson talk more about the internal surveys that we did in terms of our local stakeholders. Good evening. Um, so this evening, I have the pleasure of sharing some um, highlights of the three stakeholder surveys that we administered this past spring. Um, one would be to our staff, and that's inclusive of all staff across the Edina Public Schools, um, our parent community, and um, then we did pilot a survey, a climate type survey this uh, spring with our student population, grades six through 11. So I'll start with our staff climate survey. Um, all of our surveys function around themes, and the themes have been fairly consistent over the fa past five years, although we do annually review the survey with a team of people and adjust the questions. I'll give you an example. Um, we have, for the past three years, we have asked our staff around questions around our professional learning communities and their experience in their professional learning communities. And in the past couple of years, we have changed some of those questions in response to the experience that the teachers are having and as they continue their professional development and expand their understanding of how to really function at a very high level as a PLC some of our questions have changed in response to that so this year the the themes were PLCs um, personalized learning as we see that implemented to a greater degree across our uh, schools, we are asking specific questions around that. Workplace climate and job satisfaction, and then some workload questions, and those are traditional within our staff survey. Um, we um, do adapt to those questions, as I said, based on local needs and with input from um, Edina uh, Education uh, Minnesota in our, our local unit is part of that design process. Our survey administration this year, staff were invited via a district uh, and building communications multiple times to participate. It was an open link. So as Susan said, we consider this a non-scientific survey because actually staff could participate multiple times if they wanted to. So that's one of the considerations that we have to um, understand as we look at the data. 
hard copy surveys were available if people preferred to do them uh, hard copy rather than online. And typically our bus garage asks for hard copy surveys and then I take those back and hand enter the data. And we provide the data to you as district level summary data. Um, it, we do disaggregate the data further at the building level and that information is shared with the, the site administrators um, for them to use with their staff. Our response rate is typically around 50% of our staff when we look at inclusive of all staff members. That changes from year to year, so I will defer to We generally, Susan. generally what we talk about is about 1,000 full-time FTE, so I mean it varies between 1,000 and 1,200, but for the purposes of the staff survey, we, we generally look at about 1,000 to 1,200. And I think um, I noticed some people wondering. So we do put um, on these online surveys, we do put restrictions in terms of, you know, you should only be doing it once. But obviously with this kind of a survey, there are ways around it. So if people really wanted to get around it, they can. We don't have a lot of duplicates, but we're just trying to be open about the fact that it's not a scientific, it's a volunteer in as opposed to a seeking out a specific sample. So I wanted to share this evening with you some of the highlights. One would be around communication, leadership, and uh, direction for the district. And this comes from all, all staff across the district who participated. And as you can see, we have, um, over the past th three years, our trend data suggests that we have um, the opportunity to dig into these areas and learn a little bit more from our colleagues about how to support them with communication. Um, understanding of the initiatives across the district um, and the role of leadership in supporting their work. So before you leave that slide, yes, I'm just not sure what I'm supposed to do with that information because when I look at it, it shows a drop in confidence and uh, direction and it's not scientific. And so I'm a what are we supposed to do with this data or what are we doing with this data? That's a great question. You know, as we think, what we're asking our colleagues to do is, as they reflect upon their year, provide us some voice as to their experience and how that can inform continuous improvement efforts at the building level and across our district. And our building administrators, as well as district level administrators, use this data to inform how to um, frame conversations with staff, how to perhaps dig into something a little bit deeper and learn more about at a specific program or with at a specific site, what improvements to communications could be made to help staff feel more informed about initiatives. So it's really uh, data that's being used to inform conversation and further improvements across the district. And I think the other thing is, is that we're, we're sharing this information with you just as part of a, a report back of what's done. This is, staff survey is a really a good example of something that's really more of an internal vehicle that we would be using with our staff to say we ask, because when we ask the question, we want to go back to the audience with whom we ask the question. And so we're going back to that. And then the other thing is, is that we want to be able to dig deeper into the data and say, how exactly are they defining leadership? Who exactly are they talking about? What kinds of things do you feel that your confidence is changing in? So it's really important that when we do look at trend, we try to say, what are the issues that came up over the last year? What maybe is, you know, what maybe causes you to answer in a way, one way or another? And those are the kinds of conversations that our administrators are having with their staff at the building level. Can you give us some indication of what some of those things might be? You know, I mean, when we see, you know, like I, when I looked at the leadership, well, I thought, well, yeah, we're in transition in a couple of really big positions, um, but, uh, you know, like right direction that they're feeling that we're not going in the right. Well, some well, are. I, well I, I was going to say, I think it's important to look at the mm -hmm. aggregate, and this is, you know, certainly we have the majority of our staff feeling that we are headed in the right direction. It's always easy to kind of go to what's the, what's the negative there. Mm -hmm. We certainly would look at the confidence in the leadership of the Edina Public Schools and say, okay, what are you defining as that? What is it? Because that's what the that's the way the question was worded. So people can interpret that differently, and so that's what causes the conversation. So at the building level, we can say, help us understand where do you think you're at with that. And now again, that was last spring, and so I think it's really important. Then we when we look at these trends, it allows us conversation. It is not meant to be a decision making. It is not meant to poke uh, to talk to any one specific um, person, leadership, organization. It's really meant to look at the whole and to see where are opportunities for growth and improvement. 
So this next question asked about um, work-related responsibilities and comparing those to the same time last year. And we see that um, a good chunk of our uh, colleagues are saying that they have more responsibility compared to last year. Um, these data actually align very much with national data. Um, the Harvard Medical Group and RAND Corporation just completed a study um, across the United States and within a category they describe as white collar workers, a quarter of those respondents indicated that they do not have enough time to complete their work responsibilities. And another ha half of the group indicated that they do complete some of their work in their free time away from uh, their work environment. So I think our data uh, reflect that same kind of a trend. I think the other thing this does is it really speaks to the work that we know that we need to be doing in terms of staff wellness and in terms of how do we structure days so that we can make sure that staff feel that they have the supports they need during the time during the day. This next slide is about the ability that a parent, uh, excuse me, a colleague feels they have the ability to change or make changes to improve their current workload. Um, and this suggests, I think we can infer here, that we have staff who are really desiring a greater life-work balance and would like to have that opportunity to create that themselves. As Susan mentioned, our staff wellness program will be looking at these data specifically this year and uh, using that to inform uh, options for our staff and, and to ways to improve wellness. And then also focusing on PLC and collaborative time within the school day, how we can grow that for our staff. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that we do have some areas of concern, and certainly our colleagues are using their voice to let us know that uh, we need to have further conversation, as you can see from this slide, the majority of our staff are very proud to be uh, members of the Edina Public Schools learning community. So now our family satisfaction survey. Uh, we had two different instruments here. One is specific to our elementary program and one to our secondary program. And although the themes are the same, the questions are framed in uh, ways that are more developmentally appropriate for the age of the child. We do invite parents to complete the survey based on their oldest child within that program, elementary and secondary. But they also have the option of completing the survey again thinking of another child or multiple children if they wish to do that. Themes are safe and welcoming schools, respectful environment, schools and learning, personalized learning, and then overall impression. And again, just number-wise, are we, does the numbers look higher this year than other years? So I was just curious if we maybe, had we reached a certain percentage level that you would like to reach? I was just curious. So a response rate is very challenging to uh, calculate with our family survey because we have um, multiple parents and caregivers who can be provide or uh, answer the survey for multiple students. So if we just look at our N value, it doesn't tell us how many yeah. parents completed the survey, it tells us how many surveys were completed. Okay. So yep, yep, yep. that's a little tricky. Yep. The way that we could get around that is to send one survey to each family, mm -hmm. but then we're not hearing all voices and perspectives. So, And here are themes. Um, when I visit school, I feel welcome. You can see uh, a strong uh, positive response rate to this question at both the elementary and secondary level. Um, as I'm showing you these slides, I'd also let you know that we have hard copies available of this survey and we do target um, groups of uh, parents um, who may not have access to a computer and certainly take those back in as um, in a voluntary manner. Um, we have uh, some feedback here that overwhelmingly says that parents' perception of their child's um, like of school or enjoyment of school is high. Communication um, is, again, a strong positive response rate across both pro programs. And my child is learning a lot. I have a question here that's related to one we asked students later on that I think is also very interesting. Um, and this is an important question because we know that the uh, relationship between the teacher and the student is very important to the overall holistic development and well-being of the child. and. From the survey, our parents who responded indicated a strong uh, positive agreement with that. Mm -hmm. 
and over uh, the overall I'm satisfied with this school again is strong across both programs so our student climate survey we have been working hard to collect student voice in terms of their experience over the past few years and as Susan said there's many ways that we can gather that data and that is formally and informally. This year, our survey was um, sent out to students via their e uh, Edina Public Schools email address. All secondary parents were notified via email prior to the survey, and if they wanted their student to opt out, um, they had that option. Um, it was administered late in the school year, so the last two weeks of school. I was pleased that we had the response rate that we did, which was about 30% of all grades six through 11 students. Um, and I'm sharing with you two slides that I think um, are relevant. One is what I'm learning is meaningful to me. And we know student engagement tends to decline as students come into middle school through the end of their high school experience. Um, that's nationally. Um, a Gallup poll from 2016 indicated that there, about a million students were surveyed, and overall grades 5 through 12 level of engagement was 49%. And you can see here, different population, grades 6 through 11, and certainly a smaller number of students, but 68% uh, 68, 69% indicated that learning was meaningful for them, which is an indicator of engagement. Specifically with our grade 11 students, that Gallup poll indicated 32% of those students said that they were engaged in their learning. In our 11th grade students, there were 164 of them who responded to this survey. 70% of them answered this question that yes, they were engaged. And my teachers care about me. We asked parents the same question, and 81% said that yes, they agreed with that statement. We have the opportunity to do some gap analysis across our three stakeholder groups with this information. Um, again, um, it, I think that is some interesting work and some interesting conversations that we can have, the perception of parents to teachers to the student experience. And how does that inform further conversation learning and ensuring that the students needs are being met say so before we move on to the community survey i was curious um i think in all of the surveys there's places for open comment yes um i was wondering since there wasn't anything in the presentation if there were any trends in the open comments whether it be students parents or staff um but really curious to, 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 you know, within the students, are there themes coming out that we should be aware of or concerns within mm -hmm. our kids? So at the summary level, so all students, grades five through 11, um, the positive comments had to do with teachers and the fact that their teachers really cared about them. Relationships with, the with teachers were important and friends and that they valued their learning, that they really felt they were being prepared for what's next. And specifically those comments came from our students in grades 10 and 11. Um, recommendations from our students or areas where they would like uh, some further conversation had to do with homework. There's a lot of comments from our students about the amount of homework at the secondary level. Um, and some of them felt it was relevant and worthwhile, and others felt that uh, there was just too much of it. And you so. think in terms of stress or mental health come out? Related to the amount of homework, yes. So Me really just on that thread mostly? Specifically to homework, the amount okay. of work that's expected of them, homework. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. And as Susan said, we'll be digging more into that and at the building level and really working with our colleagues at each site to say how can we improve the climate at each site. So um, so the community survey, we've talked a lot about the community survey in terms of some of the referendum information that we've talked about at, at the work session and in prior meetings, but we did want to share some of our annual benchmark sort of stakeholder survey. And so again, this is more of, this is a scientific survey, it's a random sample, so it's representative of our community. <coughs> it's done by uh, 
external group, Morris Leatherman. They've been doing surveys in our community for, for many, many years. Um, and just sort of, a, again, how the methodology was. So it was conducted in late May. Um, a lot of people ask, you can't do, a lot of people say, well, you can't do phone surveys because nobody you know, has a landline. Well, there are 34% of them were actually cellular phone home only. And um, I, we often hear about, well, nobody answers the phone because I know I, for one, and somebody who doesn't answer the phone and I don't recognize the number. But um, they are able to get that representative sample when we get through this. And the average time of people who spent on the, on the phone with them was 27. I think Bill said that the longest one was about an hour and 20 minutes. So some people really like to share. Um, the non-response rate was 3%, which is very low. And uh, this is projectable. So that's part of that validated um, information that we appreciate, so within 4%. Um, so we just wanted to highlight a few of them. Uh, we, we took that data and, and uh, my colleague uh, reformatted them because sometimes the charts we get from Bill are hard to read. So we wanted to reformat them a little bit with some trend. But again, uh, the, we always ask, you know, what is the qual how do you rate the quality of the education provided in Edina Public Schools? And as you can see, it's been really consistent in terms of a very high quality rating. Um, and so the little bit differences that happen over five years is, is pretty much statistically insignificant. And so we really do watch that. The other thing that Bill will, will share with us, and that's the nice thing about working with the um, Morris Leatherman and Dr. Morris will say it's really benchmarked against other school districts because these are questions that are asked in a lot of different districts. And so we often, uh, Edina comes out very, very high in that, usually among the top four or five in the, in the district, if not the top. Uh, these are the open-ended survey. We always ask a couple of open-ended questions there. What do you like most about Edina Public Schools? You can see that it really does um, revolve a lot. What people value most is about the academics, the teachers, the programs, the instructional abil um, availabilities that are that are there. So uh, we're seeing a little bit change happening as, as we go through. There's always something that might pop up a little bit, but we're glad to see that um, those that high academic and the quality of, of schools is still there. Um, what's the most serious issue facing the, the district? You will see that, again, there's some, some common themes that happen and they kind of pop up depending on what the issue is. Um, in the last few, they've talked about large class size. D Bill was uh, pretty quick to point out that that comes up in every school district that they talk about class size. So it is, it's a, you know, it's one of those things that's really challenging because what is that optimal class size? Um, and he said that our 13 and 12 percent, while it's an uptick for maybe what we had in 2014, is still relatively low compared to some districts with class size. But we do know that um, the lack of funding is his actually decreased in terms of being a concern. The high taxes has gone up recently. So, so the, those are some of the conversations that obviously we had, that you had as a board um, in previous discussions around the referendum. In terms of the community survey, when we ask, you know, in general, what do you think, uh, are we headed in that right direction or wrong direction? And so that's a little bit similar to what we've asked of our staff as well. And two thirds of our, com of our community, and this is the whole community, um, all residents in the community, feel that we are headed in the right direction. Uh, with 15% saying, uh, well, a little bit of both. So, and I think that's pretty typical. But to have two thirds saying that we're headed in the right direction is affirming. Um, the this was a new question this year: is is Edina Public Schools a destination school district? We almost often hear anecdotally about why people move to the community, and this just affirms that that um, three fourths of the community said absolutely, it's you come here for the schools, and that was uh, validated with me last week having a conversation with somebody who just moved here two years ago and said, uh, I didn't care which where in Edina it was. I just told my husband moving from Washington, D.C., that we had to go to Edina for the schools. So I hear that, we hear that a lot, and so we're proud of that and want to continue that for our community. The district spends tax money effectively and efficiently. You will see here that it's a, a pretty steady, uh, consistent rate for that um, in terms of agreement right around that 70%. Uh, that's very high in a lot of districts, uh, for a lot of districts, just because you will often have people feeling that most government agencies don't spend tax dollars efficiently no matter what it is, but to have 70% agreeing that we're spending them wisely. Um, and then receiving a good investment, this is one that Bill often points out as being the highest, if not number number one or number two of, of all the metro districts that he works with um, in terms of having that uh, favorable value that people really feel that they're getting the money's worth in their investment in the school district. So you will see here that we have 94% up to 90 or down to 92%, but again, statistically insignificant, right? If anytime you're hovering above 90% of the community feeling it's a good investment, we're in a pretty good position. 
Um, and so we've asked, uh, for the last few years, we've asked about whether or not we do a good job of involving our stakeholders in decision making, and um, our district overwhelmingly feels that we do do a good job of that. We always know that we can do more to engage all, all stakeholders, but uh, the community feels that we're asking them for their input, we're asking to get them involved in task forces, and so we want to make sure that we're continuing to do that and always striving for different ways as new mediums come out. And then we have some basic school district perceptions that we ask about. Do we, um, we ask uh, in terms of does the district do trust that we are doing what's right for children? And for me, this is probably one of the most important things that we could possibly ask. And to see that 88% of the people feel that we're doing what's right for kids really does um, mean that we're headed in the right direction. I would feel sad. I mean, while we often talk about taxes and we know that those are important, if we're not doing what's right for learning, that's a struggle. Um, but we do do, but we also are have three fourths of the community still feeling that we're doing what's right for taxpayers. So we have that nice balance, and they're satisfied with the decision making as well. In terms of rating the overall job performance, so we look at four categories with that: school board, administration, principals, and teachers. And um, we have very high ratings. Our, our teachers continuously. Um, get very high ratings over 90%. Um, that is actually pretty consistent when you think about a, a PDK poll that they do annually at the national level. Um, everybody feels that their schools and their teachers are the best, and I think that ours are the best. And uh, we have evidence to show that our community really is supportive of the work that our teachers are doing. Our principals um, receive very high ratings as well, over 80%. And our administration and school board are in the 72, 73%, which is still very high when you consider that we're a public institution. And then in terms of rating the financial management of the district, you will see here that while Overall, uh, favorability has remained pretty consistent. We saw an uptick this year in terms of people kind of moving more in terms of the intensity of feeling that the financial management is excellent. Um, so overall favorability there, but seeing more in the strength of how we're doing with that. Uh, we ask a question, we've asked this for the last few years about how we're doing with our strategic plan. Uh, you can't really compare it to other districts because everybody's strategic plan is a little bit different, but in terms of, so we have uh, a third of our community, a little less than a third of our community saying that they are familiar, and uh, it's not super su surprising when you consider that we have about 25% of our community are, are families and actually have connection with the schools. Obviously, I would love to, as the director of communications, I would love for that to be a little bit higher. But what is favorable for me is that when I look at among those 31%, when you look at those who do say that they're familiar with it, they definitely feel that we're making good progress on it with a overwhelming support of being excellent or good in terms of we're, we're moving in the right direction and meeting the goals of the strategic plan. So there's the awareness that we could possibly work on, but within the awareness, we feel like we have strong favorability. And then finally, it's always good to figure out how, where are people getting their information, and this is just a different way of looking at the different uh, ways that people say that they can get it. We always, we ask a few different ones, and then we kind of leave it open as well, and you will see that about two-thirds of the um, principal sources of information that are listed here are ones that the district controls. So whether it's our newsletter or our website, there are ones that we own. Um, we have 18% say the Sun Current, that's a widely read communication publication in our community, um, especially for those who don't have direct contact with the school. So we try to make sure that we're constantly trying to give the Sun Current some ideas and they, and they do a really nice job reporting on the work in the district. Um, so we just wanted to highlight some of those items as well. This new way to do it, but. Are there any questions on the survey? And again, the survey information will be up on the district website. Um, the community survey information, I believe, is already there. The building survey information, we're going to be working with the principals a little bit, and all those details should be up later this month, if not early next month. Any questions? Not a question. I think I'll just point out one thing that stands out to me. Uh, backs up an anecdote I saw where somebody I know had said I was shopping, and at the checkout line, it came up as an option to round up to the next dollar with the change going to Edina Public Schools. And this person was laughing, saying, you know, how could Edina Public Schools need money? They're Edina Public Schools. And I'm seeing that in a little bit in the data here, too, of that mentality. In the 27 data, most serious issue, we had 6% say lack of funding. This is the scientific survey. It was twice as much in the previous survey and 200% more in the one before that. And it's just rapidly falling, number of people who'd say lack of funding. And I don't know if that means people no longer believe that, that there is a lack of funding in general for public education, 
or if it means that they get that, but there's another issue they want to talk about, and so they just move their vote over mm -hmm. to one of the other named issues. Mm -hmm. But in general, I noticed in 2014, most respondents under most serious issue said nothing or you need more money. Right. And keep and in now mind, it's this about is open-ended. Those two yes. merged, and now it's about a quarter. So, and again, I don't know if that's because there's another issue that's top of mind, or if it's because they, no long, they truly no longer believe we need funding, but that sticks out at me in the month before we go to a referendum. And I think Dr. Morris would say it, it, that because it is an open-ended question, we don't, we don't list these as items. These are just what comes up as, as themes. Um, that certainly it is what is top of mind for people when they answer that question. One of the reasons Susan and I wanted to present, it to get, present the together this evening was to share two different forms of information that we have that are important to our community student and teacher and family voice is vital to, especially at the building level, um, as we strive to better meet the needs of kids and um, our staff and our families. And certainly the data that Susan has shared as well is vital to the decision making in the district. So thank you for the opportunity to share it. And I guess I would echo what Lenny said. Oh, it's on. It's on. Okay. Um, is how can the board use this information or what what is it that the board can do with it and how does it help us <coughs> inform our work at the 30,000 feet level so there's not that I'm asking that today but just in terms of what do we do with it now that we have it and then maybe that goes back to what John was saying about um, you know thinking about how we use data and what we're going to use it for maybe throwing that in there with that question as well would be helpful oh do it John and Good to be question. clear, that was when Lenny made the point, it was for the non-scientific survey. And I think his point was knowing that this is non-scientific, what am I to do with interpreting the changes I'm seeing? Whereas the scientific survey, I just want to emphasize, I value greatly, and I'm really glad we do this annually. So on the scientific survey, there are some areas where we've dropped. And so it would be handy to have follow-up. <coughs> and for example, if what you're saying is that's a uh, metro-wide issue, then it would be good to have a slide that said, and I, I don't know if uh, they can share that data, but if it's a metro-wide issue, then it would be good to have a slide that said, you know, here's how other people, and it's not necessarily an Edina issue, but if it mm -hmm. is an Edina issue, then I think we need to dig a little deeper with Bill and try to figure out what's driving that. Certainly, in listening to Bill, um, I think in June, I heard him presenting about metro, actually it was statewide data, and then he had some metro-wide data as well. And there is just sort of a, a tenor out there that is um, less, I wouldn't say less supportive of schools, but more, you know, especially when it comes to taxes, a little bit, a, a lower tax threshold, maybe a little bit more of a tax hostile climate that he's seeing. Um, in terms of, uh, value for schools and feeling strength, um, I think that those have remained pretty consistent. At least that's what he has shared. I've seen him share a couple times in, over the spring and summer. And um, I wouldn't say that, I mean, I guess certainly you can look from year to year and see ups and downs, but I think the overall trend is that we're really pretty consistent in the community survey in most of the items, um, unless you're thinking about one in particular. But Well, so Amir pointed out within the most serious issues <coughs> that nothing moved from 34% to 21%, which is a pretty material change. Declining quality is a little bit harder to figure out because it went from on the chart to off the chart. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. it's a, you know, seven to 11 kind of gets my attention. Mm -hmm. Not on the chart to 11 really gets my attention. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of, this is under the most serious issue. Right, and, keep, and keeping in mind again, those are those are uh, um, open-ended questions in 2014. They had the open-ended question, plus they asked about, do you feel like it's still a high-quality school district? So that's why there's a differentiation. But that the question about what do you like most and what's the most serious issue literally are asked like this. What do you like most about the Edina Public Schools? Silence, let them answer. So yes, there are trends in terms of what people are saying. And when you say not sure, you know people have opinions now, and that's certainly there. But I think. Bill would be the first to say that the open-ended, when you look at that, is more about trends and not so much about the numbers and just saying, I keep playing with this 
thing here. Um, it's like very fun today. Um, but you know, what are the overall trends? And I think that in terms of the most serious issues, that is where we probably, as, as uh, Amir has said, seen some of the more changes when it comes to funding and taxpayer uh, types of issues. But in terms of the what do you like most, it's pretty consistently been over the last few years, um, you know, high academics, high quality, great teachers, great program opportunities. And so those have been fairly consistent. I would say this one is, and even he has mentioned that too, this one was a little bit different this year in terms of the open-ended. But again, it's what's top of mind for people when they answer that open-ended question. And it's asked very early in the survey so as not to get skewed by other questions that you ask. For, for staff climate, I noticed it was shifted about a month later. What's the plan going forward? Are you going to keep it in April, May, or are you going to move it to uh, May, June? Thank you, Randy. That will be up to Dr. Schultz. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> we'll um, have a conversation yeah. about how to best move forward with um, gathering data from our stakeholders and making sure that that's relevant and we're using it in, in a meaningful way. I think we have to watch when, when the surveys are conducted within the school year. Um, March to June, you have, assess, you have MCAs, you have other uh, MAP assessments going on. There's a lot of assessing, not to mention it's the spring of the year. So you have to, we have to figure out when is the best time so that it's done in a thoughtful, you know, thoughtful environment rather than maybe a harried environment, especially with students. And the legislature, and then you were mentioning the students in the legislature, um, is sensitive about when those surveys are conducted so they're not interrupting um, assessments and, and taking up student time um, in the school day. Even having external people come in and say, we would like to um, assess or survey students. So we need to pay attention to that and figure out what is the best way and really to have a purpose for the survey so that um, there's nothing worse than not having a purpose or making sure the survey is not telling us something and then having someone spend the time um, to take it. I don't think that's the case here, but it's just uh, focusing on what we really need to know and how we use the information. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next, we're moving to action items. Our first action item is the operating levy renewal. Can I get a motion to approve the calling of an election for the purpose of renewing and increasing the referendum revenue authorization? So moved. Second. And our presenter is Margot, mm -hmm. primarily. So uh, we can probably go to the r recommendation slide unless the board wants us to focus on any one particular part of the referendum. Is there anything that you would? I know, so just to give the public some background, the board has met in um, uh, two work sessions. I shouldn't say that. It's probably more than that. Four work sessions, at least two work sessions since I've been here, um, in addition to some conversation also in a, a live meeting and then tonight. So I don't know if there's more. Um, information you would like from the deck of slides there from the slides that are presented so the slides are pretty much what we had last month correct correct it's the same presentation except for the administrative recommendation slide um, so uh, I get, I'm happy to answer questions on any of the previous information presented but I won't go through each slide um, but the administrative recommendation um, after uh, finance committee in July the board work session and board meeting in July um, our home homework as administration was to um, dive a little deeper into the details of the survey information just to um, assess uh, the, the feedback in regards to um, an increase right away for the full 10 years going to the cap or a step up in, in, in anything in between and so we did do that. We also um, followed up with MDE and their, and also Election Council and our financial consultants um, to fine tune the dollar amount in the calendar year 2020 when the uh, step up occurs. Uh, the state does have projections out um, at least 10 years, if not more, um, on the estimates of what the actual, um, or what the uh, um, cap amount will be out into the future. Again, they're estimates, but the state has 
historic calculations on that, and um, I think that's about the best dollar amount we can use. So in your administrative recommendation, we um, have revised uh, that, that step up to the MDE calculated amount for uh, taxes payable in 2020. Um, other than that, there's no major changes. Um, and one of the questions the board had at the last meeting was uh, the, to uh, differentiate between uh, two-step um, moves so you would have um, uh, the recommend uh, renewal and increase of 1857.46 per pupil in 2018 with an inflationary increase in 2019. Then an additional increase <laughs> up to the cap of 2075 per pupil um, in 2020, then the inflationary increase for the added amount of taxes from 2021 to through 2027. And this authorization would last for 10 years. And um, the board had the question whether we do that all at once. And when we, we talked to um, Morris Leatherman, um, who just uh, provided the information for, and the data for the survey you just heard, and his recommendation is uh, to, that there's a risk in going out all at once um, for the whole amount that in the first year, which would be in 2018. Um, the survey is showing that a two-step process is, uh, is a process that's more palatable to the voters of Edina. So I wanted to provide that background because you asked us to um, ask Bill Morris that question, so I wanted to make sure you had that information going forward. So with and that, um, I'll leave it for your deliberation and discussion. And just to clarify that when we say tax tax impact of 182 a year on an average home value, which I believe in this case is about 500,000, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, is the increase over the current operating levy, correct? Yes, it's the increase over the current operating okay. levy. And what the first year, and so then yeah. if you were at 500 and we went to the full number, it would go up to, it would be 240 instead of 182, is that correct? Yeah, right. it'd be roughly another $5 a month. Okay, thank you. Roughly. And the information that you received from Morris Leatherman was that the two-step had greater support within the community than a one-step. Correct. Is your mic on? It is on. Oh, okay. Sounded really That's fine. correct. Do we want to recap some of our discussions since we did talk about this in our previous work session <laughs> again this evening? You have a five-minute version? <laughs> I was, yeah, I was depending ahead. on the chair to do that. Well, I, I think what had happened based on our previous work sessions and even discussions at our last uh, board meeting is that we had tasked the administration to go back and look at this and, and make sure that what they were recommending with the two-step process was really what um, they felt was the best recommendation. And so after doing that, and I'd really defer to one of them, to, to say, you know, reviewing Morris Leatherman and, and Margo's expertise with our finances, that what I heard tonight as a board member was our administration coming back to us and saying, yes, we still believe that this is the, their recommendation right. of how we should proceed with the levy. So yep. then as a board, we discussed again our thoughts on um, our agreement with that or desire to go right to the cap rather than a two-step process. Um, and I don't think we came to a complete unanimous agreement on that, but um, I, I know that we did we wanted to take into account our, um, our taxpayers' uh, feelings we're, we're seeing in some of the Morris Leatherman uh, surveys about some tax stress or tax weariness, um, but also, you know, wanting to do what's right for kids. And I think I'll leave it at that because I'm sure some of my colleagues would, would have great ways of expressing their thoughts as well. So. Right. My conclusion basically was in when I look at the administration's recommendation for a two-step and I look at the um, recommendation or the survey data from Morris Leatherman, I end up at the two-stage. I mean, it'd be great to have more money, but I think the most important thing at this moment is to make sure that we have a referendum that passes because the consequences of the referendum not passing is too severe. And I think a number of other people have expressed that same view. I don't know if anybody wants to say anything. I, I do share that view as I shared in the workshop uh, that ideally we all know that there's a great need for funding 
Um, I also trust the recommendations that we've had, and we've had a great history of having a very accurate prediction from Morris Leatherman. So I appreciate their knowledge of the Dinah Public Schools, and I trust their recommendation with that of the district. And Margo, this is the official language we need by statute that we're, we need to approve tonight to meet the time deadlines? Uh, yes, uh, all the enclosures are the official language that um, we've had our election legal counsel review and write for us. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, David Ramirez. Oh. So all in, we already had a motion, correct? Yes. All in favor say aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? Motion carried. Right. We are on to the next action item, which is election of school board members and calling of general election. So can I get a motion to approve the calling of the general election for the purpose of electing four school board members? So moved. Second. Margo, this is just official language we need to do? Yes, just part of the process to meet the requirements. Uh, like the previous resolution, um, we are required to approve this one by August 25th. So. Any questions? Well, and at this point, we do have um, 10 candidates that have filed. Is that correct? According to the state website? That is correct. So the current uh, ballot question is all left blank until uh, after Thursday when people can officially unfile if that would ever happen. And there are specific timelines throughout the whole election where uh, where we have to post an official notice of what the both ballots will look like. All that will come at a later time. Margo, before we get too far ahead, do any of these require a roll call? I'm not checking. Just I checking. So. Good question. Okay. I was more concerned about the levy than the uh, US ballot. than the other one. Mm -hmm. I thought I saw. You need to certify the election is required. Call that. Okay. All right. Any other questions on the election of school board members? Hearing none. All in favor of approving the calling of this general election for school board members? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next is the long-term facilities maintenance program. Can I get a motion to approve our long-term facilities maintenance program budget? Board members, hello. So moved. Second. <laughs> Margo, you are up. Uh, as I reported in at the July meeting, um, the, re the requirement with MDE is to have it approved by July 31st, which we did, brought forward, but that I would likely bring back um, and request uh, an additional approval or a, a change due to the fiscal year end and how our facilities projects are based on Project Summer and uh, June 30th splits that and uh, having July's uh, invoices come in, I'm able to update the information to what I believe uh, between the fiscal years to be more accurate for the MDE. So I'm requesting approval and then I'll submit this revised data to MDE for a levy certification. But it's the only change from July is merely the fiscal year. Nothing has changed in terms of projects and the 10 year plan. All right. Any questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Margo, we talked about shifting some of these mechanicals to move them up or back. Is that reflected in this, or are we just holding with the same plan, but we're, like, we got ECC. We've got, like, 24 million out in 21, 22, 23 for this building, and I'm trying to figure out, is that still accurate? Uh, we haven't revised anything that far out at this point. Okay. Uh, what we are really, um, to be honest, waiting to see is su submit all this information uh, and see what this year's levy certification looks like and how are we able to navigate and balance with operating referendum question and increase coming forward over the next couple of years in tax impact. Um, and and to be honest, what we do, we also look at long-term facility maintenance on an annual basis. Um, if we save and bids come in good, 
Now, when you're talking about mechanical systems, bids, I mean, um, we would not be able to accelerate a mechanical system, but we will move projects forward if we are saving and uh, doing things a little more efficiently and able to do so. And, and that might compoundingly then help us with some of the bigger projects. Um, but we've, we've kept really true to that 10-year plan right now because it's all partnered with construction at this point. Um, and in, I, I would see us taking a more closer look at that um, after construction's complete, and then we're focusing again on the long-term facility maintenance only, and then getting through the next two levy certifications. Thank you. Any other questions? All in favor of approving the long-term facilities maintenance program budget, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next, we have policy re review. Can I get a motion to approve policies 410, 413, 414, and 415? So moved. Second. Regina. Okay. Are, are there been any changes? So there are no changes to any of the policies before us for action this evening. I'll make a comment regarding 413, harassment and violence prohibition with students and employees. We had a question at the last board meeting regarding the term gender, and the policy committee did have a discussion with legal counsel again to make sure that we were pursuing the best recommended course. It's our intent to provide the strongest protection for all students and staff in all circumstances, and toward that end, our conclusion is that the legal counsel recommendation to leave the language as is is the one that we are putting forth tonight is leaving the language with gender as our strongest position. Great. Any questions? Well, ju just a comment. Um, having raised the, the question last time, uh, the, the concern of the board, as I understand it, is to make it absolutely clear to make sure it's sense is made clear on this record that the purpose of the change is, is to make sure that um, all individuals, regardless of GLBTQ status, are fully protected by our policies. And we want no ambiguity about that. I'm not sure this was the right way to change the policy to do that, but that was the advice of counsel. And the idea is to have that statement on this record to make sure that uh, there's no question about what the, what the intent is. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All in favor of approving policies 410, 413, 414, and 415 say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. We're on to information. I think that, that we are done with action items. Information, there's a student rights and responsibilities handbook within the materials. Are there any uh, leadership updates or committee reports? Amir, you looked like you were about to say something, no? No, I'm still thinking about what Dave was saying about. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you already, you already voted. <laughs> That's long gone. <laughs> That's the look you got. <laughs> All right. I, I actually just had a question. I was curious um, uh, for facilities committee. Are we, how close are we to doing the final bids for Highlands and Creek Valley, our two outstanding buildings? And are we still um, on track to be able to complete them at the level we had discussed? How, Susan, why don't you take that? <laughs> so we actually have three buildings to bid. Yeah. We have Valley View, Creek Valley, and Highlands. They'll be bid this fall. Uh, right now we're about 85% bid out okay. and uh, on track on budget. It's kind of what we're looking at right now. Obviously come, um, start of school we're very excited about the start of school we're a little nervous about the start of school because we have a lot of construction going on but in talking we have weekly conversations with our construction partners and you know school will start the first day of school right after labor day and just like any home construction project you know nothing's going to be perfect on the first day but our staff and our administration and our building staff is just really putting out plans and how we're going to make everything work and we're pretty excited about the spaces um, that are coming together right now and these just even looking from last week to this week it's really exciting but the bids uh, will be coming out in I think October we'll be doing bid in October and uh, you'll be approving bids in November for Highlands Valley View and Creek Valley yep. and then construction would start um, springish okay and do we have a sense 
as to say the high school in particular with you know bringing in two huge new classes if if the kids will get access to the building before the first day of school or do we are we too unsure still to say mm, no <laughs> they probably um, no but the but the principal I know principal Beaton has been working with staff on how to have them come on the first day of school the first few hours first half day of school it's only those new students so they do have an opportunity to do that but there won't be typical like in the past where you can walk your school but the way mm -hmm. they look at it is that it's new for everybody and so everybody will be doing the new including principal Beaton he said you know he's he's working through that as well so that's we've got a lot of um, wonderful student engagement programs in place with the link crew and everything to really kind of help people find where they need but every half of that school is going to be new we have about a third or a fourth of the staff is new so there's going to be a lot of people looking for spaces and so everybody's going to be learning together okay and then to follow up then on that since there won't be you know the typical things that parents and kids are used to in terms of the you know open houses and things will there be anything after school starts for for us to welcome in our parents to see the new spaces that their kids are seeing on the first day of school absolutely i mean we're still having good connect a day there will still be open house um but just later than than a little bit later i mean if they're doing it in um, in September but uh, absolutely there will be an opportunity for that right. we probably won't be doing big community open house until later in the fall because as we work through punch list items the the gyms are going to be online later in the fall as we know so just working through um, some of that and then we'll be very proud to show it off to the whole community at the high school but uh, the other schools are a lot I mean Concord and Countryside they're already moving stuff in there Cornelia is very uh, coming along Southview is tight um, and here in our building we have Normandale and in the early learning center as you heard are are also coming along but the first day of school is going to be exciting and the new transportation facility we're very very excited about mm -hmm. and I think next week or is it this week or next week we have the parade of buses moving down there so when did the buses move uh, we have to get occupancy but I just talked to David White this morning and um, uh, they're doing the final checks at the old bus garage. Mechanical is still at the old bus garage. Uh, they have a whole series of tests that they do on each bus, getting ready for school. Mm -hmm. And then as they complete that, they will be moving the buses over to the new facility. So um, well they, uh, we are planning on running the back to school workshop Monday at the new facility with the drivers. So we are very excited about that. That's great. Thank you. All right, anything else? Any updates on the uh, sale of the old property? Uh, we had uh, some, we had the fuel tanks removed and um, the drain, uh, a drain and some, the, the legal portions of the purchase agreement that we as a property owner were required to do. And we're waiting for results back uh, from one of the final, final tests, which actually were supposed to come in um today or tomorrow coming in closer so other than that it's been quiet right now um well uh we will hear something because the in the purchase agreement the first date is august 31st and so um and then there's an opportunity to extend for another 30 days so we will be hearing something within the next week or two on, on whether that can be achieved or not. And I'm sure they're waiting for the results of this test that uh, we just had recently, so. Thank you, Margo. Mm -hmm. All right. Any objection to adjourning? Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.